But one of the things is, if we were to take that experience and look at how even us, we perish for a lack of knowledge. Anytime that we're not knowledgeable of our enemies, anytime we're not knowledgeable of God, anytime we're not knowledgeable of things that go on around us, or when we don't take the time to educate ourselves, we perish because of our ignorance. And even in the United States and in various places around the world, ignorance is not an excuse for not knowing the laws of the land. Although you don't know the laws, you're still subject to those same laws. So therefore, if we're going to be subject to the laws of God, then we might as well educate ourselves to the laws of God, the precepts, the ordinances, uh, the, the commandments. His word tells us how to love one another and to respect one another. It also teaches us how to go in and out amongst those around us. And it also gives wisdom to those that are unwise. And it also gives us direction on how to live our lives. But the thing is, also outside of the word of the Lord, going back to uh, Habakkuk, or Hosea, excuse me, the fourth chapter and the first verse, one of the key things there was hear the word of the Lord. And hearing the word of the Lord also means that you read and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. But it also means opening up your voice, your ears rather, to hear the voice of the Lord. God gives us directions and instructions. And sometimes if we neglect to obey what he is saying, then we fall into situations and circumstances that are beyond our control. The Bible also says here that even when our calamity comes upon us, God himself will mock us because we didn't obey or listen to the word of the Lord. Sometimes God is giving you ideas and you fail to enact those ideas or research those ideas out. Or he's giving you instructions on what to say or where to go or whom to see and you neglect to do it and you don't reap the benefit of it and then something devastating comes into your life. And then you wonder why it happened but God will repeat to you in a loving way, I gave you instructions on what to do but you failed to obey the knowledge that I was given to you. Therefore, you're perishing or you're being destroyed in a certain area. But don't be dismayed because, yes, God wants us as his people to be educated and to know him. But he also wants us to be able to understand how, again, to do certain things. Just, as, just, just let us explore some of the few people in the Bible that really were in devastating situations. We talked about Joseph before. Joseph was a man who was sold into slavery by his brothers, and we talked about him a great deal some time ago. But he acted wisely. God, I believe, through his prayer life and his devotion to God, God gave him instructions because Joseph was a very spiritually insightful man. Whenever God spoke to him or showed him something, he communicated that and communicated it effectively and wisely. And whether those who heard him agreed or disagreed, it still did not sway Joseph from his path, even when he was taken into uh, to, to Potiphar's house and ultimately incarcerated. He still again used his wisdom, listen, to be able to keep the prison in order, which means that he knew how to account for the prisoners. He knew how to articulate with the prisoners as well as the guards of the prison. He also gained a level of trust because of his knowledge and his integrity and knowing how to function and how to be honest and knowing that he was there, although unjustly, unfairly, he still didn't buck the system. He actually communicated his intent that he was still going to remain subject to them, but yet all the while waiting for God to bless him. And the thing is, because he applied wisdom and knowledge, God blessed his hands. You cannot just be a spiritual person and not be knowledgeable and insightful and understanding and use wisdom. Because even if God gives you great insight in the hands of the fool, it means nothing. But when God gives you wisdom and insight, it's ultimately to bring you into a position. We always talk about authority, but a position of rulership or a leadership. 
And leadership, one of the things that you have to do is learn to lead by the example of your life. And Joseph led by the example of his life. He knew how to take care of Potiphar's household before he was incarcerated. The finances of the household, he knew how to wisely divvy up the monies and what to expend and the expenditures of the house and also making sure that he was not overdraft. Even sometimes some of us ignore how to handle our own personal finances. And we ignore the fact that we should keep ledgers and books and things of that nature so that we could see how our how we are spending our monies. And a lot of times we end up in holes because of the fact that we're not good stewards over our finances. We don't take the time to sit down and see where our monies are being spent. And is that a wise expenditure or if some adjustments need to be made, looking at our monthly expenses and see where Certain things are a luxury as opposed to a necessity. And if I really don't need this or can I downsize certain things so that I can make sure that my family is not struggling financially and set up a savings account so that we would have something to fall on. Many times we make good money, but we don't use that money wisely. And a lot of times in marital situations, a lot of conflicts arise over money because one person wishes to spend and one person wishes to save or we make foolish decisions even together. But sometimes it's just sitting down even with a financial counselor or someone that can give you wisdom on how to handle your resources and how to handle them wisely. That's being knowledgeable, that's being wise, that's giving understanding. And a lot of times you'll sit down and you begin to count your finances and seeing where you're spending money on, where you think it's just 2 or $3 here. Just give an example for lunch. Sometimes you're spending money on lunch and when you sit down and count the cost of what you're spending for lunch and, and eating out, you'll find that that could be a car payment or a bill, major bill, or money that could have otherwise been saved if you just... Learn how to cook and do certain things. But going back to the, the knowledge part, to the people we have to become knowledgeable. Knowledge meaning that we don't gain a knowledge that takes us away from God, but we gain knowledge that proves God. And the thing about this is that when I read articles online or in uh, certain chat rooms or various places, a lot of scientists and archaeologists have actually proven the existence of God. They have proven that the historical biblical accounts of various events and cities that are a long since lost through their archaeological digs and things of that nature have been discovered. Some of them have even refuted the theory of evolution, meaning that a man uh, came from a, 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 a microorganism developed into something larger and became a land creature developing to, into an ape, an ape developing into a man. But some of them have refuted that uh, because they talk about the Big Bang Theory, which means there was a large explosion. But years ago, I preached the message because the Bible says that God's voice is as great thunders. And even if you read the account of the children of Mo or Israel, excuse me, in the uh, book of Exodus, you'll find that when God spoke to them, when Moses was up on the mountain, his voice thundered so loudly that the people feared. And my thing, the Bible says that God spoke and everything that is came into existence. The Big Bang Theory was more or less or nothing short of the voice of God speaking Everything that previously had existed in him, out of him, and caused it to be created and become what it has evolved into, not the evolution of theory, but how God created both the heavens and earth, according to Genesis, the first chapter going through the third chapter, and everything that is is created by God himself. God makes no mistakes and he doesn't come through a microscopic organism. But when God spoke, he created all the creatures of the sea, all the beasts of the field, and all the fowls of the air. And after that, he created man in his own image, not from a microscopic organism or from an ape, but from the dust of the earth 
And the Bible said he formed man in his own image and breathed into him the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And then God put man to sleep and took a rib from his side and created womb man, woman. And that's how we came into existence. But when you understand God and have experienced God, which is a major key here, these people can refute what they don't know because they've not had an experience with God. Once you have an experience with God, regardless of whether you stay with him or walk away from him, you have a knowledge of him that most people do not have. Most people struggle with the existence of God. Most people struggle with knowing that he does truly exist. And even down to Christianity, most a lot of Christians even struggle with the ex inv invisible existence of God. That's why most people have difficulties when it comes to their prayer lives. Because we're so visual in nature and we're so uh, ever hearing people speak to us or being able to touch folk and embrace them that it's very difficult for us to comprehend and understand the invisible existence of a holy God. But yet that God is closer to us than anyone that is currently in our space right now. Even if someone has breached or broached your personal space, listen, God is even yet closer to you than them. The Bible says he is a friend that sticks up closer than a brother. So if we come into the understanding that God is always with us, even uh, there's a prayer that talks about a person that is in trouble, but even the, the talks about seeing the footprints in the sand, but yet the time that they only saw one set of footprints, that poet states this, but during those times that you didn't see it, it was me carrying you and not you walking. And God is ever present with all of us. He knows everything that is about us. He knows every hair that is on, the, on our heads and the follicles. And even those of us that lack hair or, or have chosen to, to not have hair, such as myself, he still knows the follicles and the potentials for us to have hair. He knows everything about us dynamically in and out of us, outside of us. He knows our every single thoughts. He knows things about you that you don't even know about yourself. But yet, we don't depend on his knowledge. But prayer is more or less a seeking the knowledge of God to gain a better understanding, to gain the wisdom. There's a verse that said, and I've said it before, that I will show you great and mighty things that you know of not of. I'm going to educate you in the things that you are not knowledgeable of. And considering the vastness of God, there is no way that we will be fully able to comprehend everything about him. The Bible even says of Jesus that he did so many things that even the books in the world could not contain them. But hear this, even in 1 Corinthians it talks about even after we have been, after we have known him, or we will know him even as we are fully known by him, ultimately, after we are in his presence completely and totally.